Hi, I'm Brett with Millennial Apps Tech Tips. Today we're looking at Apple's latest MacBooks from a developer's perspective. We've got the 2015 MacBook, 12 inch MacBook, and ultra portable, and the 2015 MacBook Pro, 13 inch MacBook Pro, not too shabby itself, very portable device. We're going to put these head to head. Again, from a developer's perspective, there are a lot of videos out there comparing these two, but they they leave out a lot of the, the core considerations for a developer, and so it's important to me. That's what I'm looking for, and so I'm just going to share what I've found using both of these for a couple of weeks, and, uh, and hopefully that'll be helpful for you. So let's put these head to head. We'll look at everything from portability, the display, keyboard, connectivity, battery life, um, raw performance. Let's see how these stack up. Portability. Both of these laptops are incredible. They're, they're ultrabook category, very portable. Obviously the 12 inch MacBook, if you're looking for something that feels like an iPad, I mean it doesn't get much, much lighter than this, much thinner than this. Uh, incredible just to experience. I, I recommend you at least go find a, an Apple store nearby and, and take a look at this just for the, the engineering feat it is to cram so much into such a small space. You, you hear a lot of talk about well it's a you know it's a core M processor so it's you know it's not going to be very performant. Um, I found it to be very usable for day-to-day -day, um, programming tasks, um, browsing, running you know five six seven apps at a time you know, I've got a web browser up I'm, I'm running parallels on this thing and it and it performs you know very well you might catch a few display hiccups when when swapping between screens but um, but very smooth you know otherwise so I was pleasantly surprised with the performance on this guy super portable MacBook Pro 13 inch not too bad itself I mean this is a small laptop um, you know, about twice the weight, about four pounds than the um, than the the 12 inch MacBook, but it's still very portable. Pick it up with one hand. You know, you really can't ask for, <laughs> for anything more than that out of a laptop this powerful. Battery life. Apple claims nine hours for the 12 inch MacBook, ten hours for the 2013 MacBook Pro. This is you know on a light usage web browsing you know if you're programming on this thing running the compiler pegs the CPU so if you're if you're continually compiling all day you, you might expect half that five or six hours that's been you know my experience on heavy usage but you know there's a lot of research involved with programming too so if you've got you know stack overflow up in a web browser uh, doing research while you're programming you're somewhere between you're probably six and uh, six and ten hours on each of these I could tell a little, a uh, little bit better um, per performance battery-wise from the the 13 inch and, and just using it for a week, um, but both of them excellent. Nine to ten hours of, of battery on light usage. That's that's incredible. Huge step up from previous generations of laptops. The display, one of the most important considerations when looking at a, a laptop for development. How much screen real estate do I have? How many pixels can I cram on this tiny screen so I can actually get some work done? Well, good news, both of these come with Apple's Retina display. So you're talking about an incredible number of pixels, a lot of screen real estate available. You do have to do a little bit of configuration to, to make that happen. You know, by default, Apple comes in with, um, you know, with a almost unusable uh, the, ret the raw retina display because they're giving you about four uh, four pixels for every one. So everything's very large on screen. So you need to go in. First thing you're going to want to do is go into display settings from system preferences and uh, and set this to more space. Now on the 12 inch you have you just slide it over to more space is all there is to it. That's going to move you from uh, from Apple's default retina resolution down to 1440 by 900, which is not a lot of screen real estate. Now the 13 inch they actually give you two options for more space. If you slide that all the way over to the right there it's going to get you to 2048 by 1280 which you're talking about three almost 400 more vertical pixels which makes a lot of difference in just your you know your screen height that you have to work with um, you're trying to browse down a you know a code file or what have you in, in Xcode Android Studio something like that you've just got a, a lot more you can look at 
Um, so, so that's just with Apple settings. Now you can also run an app like Resolution tab and get access to more raw resolution. So it actually makes the 12 inch a little more usable, can get you beyond just the 900 vertical pixels of real estate. So definitely look into that, especially if you end up with this 12 inch, you're probably gonna wanna, if, if you have good eyesight, uh, or a good pair of glasses, you're probably going to want to look at, um, at something like Resolution Tab to get access to some more pixels in there just to make it a little more usable. Both displays are gorgeous. Again, Apple Retina displays IPS technology, so they look good from any viewing angle. The colors stay sharp at any and true at any viewing angle. Um, you know, couldn't be happier either of them. You know, they're uh, both excellent displays, so I think you can't go wrong there keyboard now 13 inch macbook pro apple's classic macbook keyboard nothing new here why change what works well you know but they did change it 12 inch so thin they couldn't cram the old macbook keyboard in there and so we have a new style of keyboard here mechanical keys which you know when you first hear mechanical keys you start thinking about um, you know gaming keyboards um, IBM Classic keyboards. I personally type on a, my desktop on a mechanical keyboard. I love it. So uh, you know, I had high hopes when I first came into the Mac store to try this out, and then you realize, well, the key travel is is almost non-existent. And so when you first type on this, if you're like me, you're gonna be thinking, there's no way I could use this computer day in and day out. The good news is, five minutes of typing on this. And, and I, I, it becomes actually acceptable and you start to, to learn the feel. It is a full-size keyboard. Both computers here have a full-size keyboard, which is nice. Um, the, just the key travel is gonna take a little getting used to. Um, I actually, I don't know if I can say I prefer the, the new MacBook keyboard, but, but there's something about it that I'll miss when I, when I go and, um, and, and go solely start using the 2013, which, I'll go ahead and tell you, this was my pick when, when looking at these head-to-head, -head. and we'll get into that later, but um, there's something I'm going to miss about the mechanical, the new keyboard, but you can't go wrong with the 13-inch, the proven 13-inch MacBook Pro keyboard, um, so tight competition there. Okay, the elephant in the room, connectivity. I'm sure you've heard by now, 12-inch MacBook, one port, USB Type-C. So cutting edge, maybe even bleeding edge. Apple's really out ahead of the pack on this. Um, it is a, a, an industry standard, so it's not like your lightning port proprietary connectivity. So this will be in wide use at some point in the future, but right now you can't even get Apple's, you can't even get Apple's adapters for these things. So, uh, so it's definitely the, you know, they're definitely taking a step out there and providing this as the only port on the laptop. Um, so yeah, you've got to have an, a $79 Apple adapter if you want to hook up uh, an HDMI display. Um, that particular adapter will let you charge and, uh, and plug in the display at the same time, which, you know, it's, it's, I guess that's good, um, 80 bucks on top. So, so this is really going to be the killer for most people, um, you know, not being able to plug in a USB device unless you buy a $20 or $30 adapter just to plug in your USB device and then you can't charge. You know, the, the nine hour battery redeems it somewhat, but it's still, it's just a, a big leap to, to go to one port. You know, at least they could have given us another USB-C on this side, you know, you've got your, your headphone uh, and mic uh, port there. So, so no joy, you're gonna have to live with the one port. 13 inch MacBook Pro on the other hand, it's got your same setup as usual. Dual Thunderbolt ports, USB, 3.1 headphone jack. On the other side, you've got your HDMI, so no dongles required to go from Thunderbolt to HDMI. You've got your SDXC card reader and another USB 3.1 port. So if you're going from a MacBook Pro to this, you're probably gonna hate it because you've been spoiled by so many ports. This was one of the big decision makers for me in the end. Uh, if I go somewhere and I need to hook in a projector, just the fact that I'm gonna have to remember to have a cable, to, if I wanna run dual displays, you also get, you can't do it with this guy until they come out with some other, you know, some other port that allows that or adapter. Um, and then the, the resolution, you can push more resolution from the MacBook than you can from the, the external display here. So, you know, connectivity is an issue for you at all. 
look at the 13 inch MacBook Pro. It's still ultra portable. You know, it's not like an iPad, but it's still really good. Sharp computer. Um, definitely the winner in connectivity is the MacBook Pro 13 inch. Okay, let's talk about performance. So again, general usage, both of these perform surprisingly well. The MacBook 12 inch is it's hard to differentiate from the, the MacBook Pro, and I think that can be attributed to the, the Broadwell, Intel Broadwell architecture, even though it's a core M, this is the latest, the latest stuff out of Intel. And you know, the, the, they're both dual cores. The, the core M actually does have turbo boost, which gets it right up to about the base clock speed of the MacBook Pro, which also turbo boosts on further and beyond. But you really, you know, I don't notice that in day-to-day -day usage. Where I do notice it is compile times. And so what I've done is I've taken one of my uh, my mobile apps in Xcode and did a clean build. So everything's getting built. It's about 100, line, 100 files of Swift source code. And this is running Swift 1.2. And so I just wanted to see, you know, how do they perform head to head? How long does it take to do a full build on, on both of these? And so the, the MacBook Pro came out a uh, minute, 10 seconds to build my entire project from scratch. And then running the same build, MacBook 12 inch, was a minute and 45 seconds. So a minute 10, a minute 45. What I found on these full builds is you can actually look at the Geekbench CPU benchmarks for 64-bit multi-core. You wanna do the 64-bit multi-core uh, benchmark and that will give you a good idea of what, uh, of how the, the compile time is gonna rack up because it's, it's so compiler or so CPU intensive compiling these programs if you um, just look at the Geekbench scores, if you want to know how long is it going to take to compile my code, you know, this was a big question I had before uh, actually getting a hold of these laptops. You know, I've also got a, um, a Mac Mini quad core, and I was able to, to run this same test on, on all three of those, and that's and also an older MacBook Pro, and that's where I was able to come up with um, with this you know theory and then and kind of prove it that you know the Geekbench score really does tell you how long it's going to take to compile your program. So hopefully that'll save you just that piece of knowledge. It'll save you from, you know, having to do too much shopping around if you're trying to just cut compile times. So good news again with um, with Swift 1.2, now we have incremental builds, which means if I make changes to one file and no other files depend on that, it only, the compiler only has to recompile that single file, which greatly cuts down the build time. I did a, um, one a file just like that here um, on both computers you couldn't tell the difference they were both instant instant build and run couldn't even clock it and so so that's really good news you know you're not going to be building your whole solution that often uh, if you're using xcode and the latest swift release so um, so it may not you know the the cpu may not be that much of a player anymore so that's um that's where these you know these core m's these smaller computers uh, with the latest technology they build so quickly, it's um, it, it's really hard to to justify spending more on a uh, on a more expensive machine just for more uh, CPU power in some instances like this. So um, now in this case, you're you're spending about the same because <laughs> Apple charges so much for these um, for these Mac, new MacBooks, uh, 1299 base, and then if you want to to step up to more storage, more CPU, you can go 1599. So um, so yeah, you just, there's a lot of considerations when looking at these side by side storage, both of these guys blazing fast running Samsung PCIe SSD drives, solid state drives in both of these guys, not your old SATA drives. These are PCIe. So they're wired directly in four lanes, directly wired in to the board, to the CPU and blazing fast. I mean, you run some disc benchmarks on these needles going to be pegged off the charts. Um, it is, um, it, and the speed on these, the raw speed bandwidth is going to be dependent upon the size of drive you get. The, the larger the drive you get on these, the more performant the drive. I believe they have the same number of IOPS between the sides, which is your like your uh, your input output per second. But as far as transfer speed, you get a lot more transfer speed with the larger drives. Now, one point of frustration with the MacBook, uh, the MacBook Pro is their base model only comes with a 128 gigabyte solid state drive where the base model of the MacBook comes with a 256 gigabyte drive. Now, for me, this was a major issue because I want to run parallels and I want to have Windows running in its own partition. Well, if you try to do that on a 128 gigabyte drive, you're not going to be installing much else on your computer. So 
256 is a bare minimum for what I'm looking at. And so automatically you're looking at a two to $300 increase in price just to get the larger drive on the MacBook Pro. So where you look at when you're comparing base models, you know, the 1299 base model here and the 1299 base model here, it's a, there's a different hard drive in the base model. So hopefully Apple will clean that up in the next release and, and up the base storage to 256 gigabytes, which is, you know, pretty standard. And, and you would expect that for a pro model laptop to have at least that. Um, so we'll keep an eye on that as the, the next releases come around with the uh, maybe the Skylake refresh this fall, um, get some new CPUs, maybe some wireless charging in there, better graphics, who knows what will be coming in the fall. So you may want to hang on and, and look out for that before before pulling the trigger on a purchase right now. But um, but the storage as a whole, great on both of these, you know, with the, the SSDs make all the difference in your day-to-day -day usage, how snappy the, the, um, the computer is just in opening apps. Um, switching between apps is just lightning fast, and a lot of that's because of the SSD. I would definitely recommend not buying any computer that, uh, that does not have an SSD these days. So there you have it, two amazing laptops. Uh, tough decision for a developer who wants to be you know, have a portable office. So for me, the, the deciding factor was surprisingly not performance. This 12-inch MacBook is blazing fast. It's hard to tell the difference. They're both dual-core day-to-day usage. They run neck and neck. Um, if you were to step up to, say, a 15-inch MacBook Pro quad-core, the two extra cores do make a ton of difference um, in what you're doing. You start adding in discrete graphics. You can do a lot more if you're talking about video editing, things like that, where you're going to be rendering films. I'm talking pure development. For me, um, I, don't, I don't really need that. I don't notice a need for that. These are blazing fast for everything I'm doing, even in parallels, even running Windows, um, compiling Visual Studio works great for me. So I've been super, super impressed and pleased with both of these. So that wasn't the deciding factor. What was is the connectivity. Again, single port USB-C scares me being locked in with that um, for, for the next year or two in a laptop. Um, that was a little bit much more than I could bite off. And then the extra inch and extra 200 or so pixels of screen real estate on the MacBook Pro really uh, really makes a difference in, in just usability, being able to clearly see the screen at a real sharp resolution. Um, it was just, just that much better on the, the MacBook Pro. And so those are really the two deciding factors for me. The keyboard did grow on me, so that wouldn't that's not what knocked this one out. But um, I actually think I'll, I'll miss the, the mechanical keys a little bit. It did take some getting used to. Um, but still, I mean, I, could, I think I could live with this computer. MacBook Pro is just the, the ports, the display, just a little better for me. But both of these amazing computers. Well, there you have it. I hope this video has been helpful for you in making a decision on your next MacBook. Be sure to like this video, subscribe for more helpful tips for developers, and leave any comments you have, questions in the comments, and we'll follow up with more. Thanks.